to introduce this episode of An American Gallery, here is Edward G. Robinson. He was a star of the Yale football team. The records indicated he was an art major, but his instructors in those courses rarely saw him. In two years, he was a college dropout. He wandered west. He came to know the Santa Fe Trail, the Oregon Trail, the Indians. Within the spread of only a few years, he worked as a cowboy, a prospector, a rancher. He owned a third interest in the Kansas City Saloon and knew as much about horses, if not more, than those who were born to the saddle. But no matter what he did, the desire to sketch and paint dominated. When his sketches of the West began to sell to Eastern magazines, he dedicated himself to depicting the romantic West that so fascinated him. His name was Frederick Remington, and today his paintings are known the world over. He was present in 1890 during the last Indian uprising. The Sioux great chief, Sitting Bull, had been killed only days before Remington arrived. The end wasn't in sight. This is Remington's own story. Frederick Remington, painter, saluted this week on An American Gallery. Richard Widmark stars as Frederick Remington in Westward the Painter. there. Put down your gun, soldier, unless you consider charcoal and a sketch pad a dangerous weapon. You Remington? Frederick Remington. Where's General Miles? I'll take you to him. I've got to see your pass first. Oh, they must have moved the North Pole down to the Dakotas. I guess it's 20 below. I need your pass. Your pass. Your... All right, my pass. Here. This way. I'll take my sketching here. All right, let's go. He's some kind of artist. Some kind. Right over here. That's a general sorrow, sir. It's a fine-looking animal. Did you know that the sorrow is one of the... Uh, my name's Thompson, if you need me. I'll call you. General Miles, Mr. Frederick Remington. The painter. Oh, yes, Remington. Uh, that'll be all, Thompson. I'm uh, sure you can do it with some hot coffee. Wolf boy. Why, you ugly Cheyenne, it's been two years. Painter Remington, what you do here? Well, what do you think? I'm going to sketch some of the excitement. That is, my hand doesn't freeze off first. You scouting for the general? Oh, one of my best. How come you know each other? General Miles, I've spent most of the last ten years in the West. Got lots of friends out here. Say, uh, Wolf Voice, tell me, what about high walking and stump horn? They here, they scout. Oh, good. Your coffee, Remington. Oh, thank you. Smells horrible. It feels hot. I appreciate it. Say, Wolf Voice, I, I don't trust that Thompson character. Would you see that my horse is taken care of? I do. Thanks. Remington, have you any idea what you got yourself into when you asked to join this scouting party? <sighs> Coffee tastes better than it smells. Uh, what you're trying to say, General, uh, is that you don't like the responsibility of a civilian on your hands, right? I have the responsibility of a few thousand civilians on my hands and posts and settlements all around here. Mm -hmm. But they're not figuring on riding into the middle of action brandishing a sketch pad to stop a bullet from a Winchester. The Sioux have Winchesters? 6,000 Winchesters in the hands of 6,000 bucks. And they all know how to use them. Uh. Now, they've already stolen 500 head of government cattle and hauled them away in stolen wagons to their stronghold in the Badlands. Oh, they've been telling us back east that Sitting Bull was killed. Nine days ago. Now, those braves are angry. They're angry, they're armed, and we don't know what they're going to do. Uh-huh. The question is, General Miles, what are you going to do? Follow orders, which means we send scouting parties to try and see what they're up to. Now, if they're planning any massacres, we want to have a warning. Now, Lieutenant Casey is leading a party out at sunup. They start by train and continue by horse. They'll be coming in contact with the Sioux. Now, I can't stop you from going with Casey. Neither can I stop you from getting yourself killed. Do I make myself clear, Remington? Yes, sir. Uh, General, that sorrel of yours, you mind if I sketch it before turning in?
small scouting party has gone about as far as it can go on this railroad spur. In another moment, we'll be mounting our already saddled horses, which have shared this cattle car with us, and we'll be heading into Sioux territory. Our column will consist of 17 men, eight regular cavalry, Sergeant Thompson, Wolf Voice, and five other Cheyenne scouts, with Lieutenant Casey leading us. The lieutenant is all army, a stern man whom I suspect will follow his orders to the letter. Rankin, you ride behind me. Right. All right, men, your attention. Over that ridge is Sioux country. We move into it tomorrow. For now, we journey down river to where our scouting party from Pine Ridge is camped. Okay. Sergeant Thompson, uh, we see Sioux, we start shooting. Right? Wrong. My orders are to locate the Sioux and keep them from committing massacre. But we avoid warfare. You all get that? Uh, Those are orders. Thompson, I'll hold you responsible if any man fires without a direct order from me. You hear me, Thompson? Yes, sir, I hear. Remington, back in the column. I'm just trying to sketch the... Back in rank. Sergeant. Oh! been on the move for seven hours now. The days are short at this latitude, and the sun is quickly leaving us. It doesn't seem possible that this is Christmas Eve. Missy is probably decorating the tree back home. And I'm thinking of all the men who brought their wives to settle in this wilderness. Incredible. The men, including the Indian scouts, seem on edge. I'm not entirely certain they'll obey Lieutenant Casey's orders. They're eager for a fight. And if they see a Sioux, I feel certain. Come in! Help! They must be attacking our party from the high and race. Camp's just minutes around this bend. Now we can flank them. Drive them off. Let's hear what Wolf Voice has to say. Twenty Sioux. Maybe thirty. Attack camp. We can get them all, sir. We'll get none of them. Just scare them off. That's an order, Sergeant Thompson. Now we're moving in. We fire in the air. I don't want to see one Sioux fall. You guys! You make picture, Major Remington? I'm trying to. But my hands are so cold I can hardly hold the charcoal. Hmm. They, uh... Sergeant Thompson doesn't seem too happy about this little expedition. And Cheyenne scouts know like plenty. Shoot at Cheyenne. Cheyenne won't shoot back. We won't get Sioux horses. Can't kill Sioux. Can't get Sioux horses. Not like this kind of war. A kind of war you don't understand, is that it? Yes. You going to obey the lieutenant's orders? You could... Stop painting and become general. <laughs> no, Wolf Voice, I don't think I could. Hard for Indian to change old ways, too. Maybe even hard for a white soldier. You show Wolf Voice picture? Sure. It's you. When you raced back to tell Casey about the attack on the camp here. It's good. You make look like horse moving. Well, thank you, Wolf Voice. That's what I try to do. I like to give the feeling of motion to my work. I like my pictures to tell a story, not just decorate a bare wall over somebody's fireplace. This new poor white man? Pictures that move, that tell story? Yeah, that's pretty much so, Wolf Voice. You're smiling. Inside, Wolf Voice laugh. For a thousand moons, Indians... Paint pictures that move and tell stories. <laughs> Why, you ugly redskin, you know you're right. Now, you just stay away from my publishers in the East before they find out what a phony I am. You not be afraid. Painter Remington's pictures more better than Indian make. I take first watch. You sleep now. 
Much happened tomorrow. Much danger. Somehow, in spite of the cold, I know that in moments I'll be asleep. I look around at the men here and I see fear. In the faces of the Cheyenne, too. Not the fear of men going into battle, but the fear of men who have been ordered not to defend themselves. The old masters would have appreciated these faces. As for me, I'll wait for the action. Morning. That's good shooting. You mean for an artist? For any man. I hope you ride as well. Better. We're going to hit a piece of country like none you've ever seen. Good. That's why I'm here. And the Sioux, I've never seen them either. You will. Not up. I started to cross the Cheyenne River. I knew why Wolf Voice was concerned about my horse being smooth shod. The river was frozen halfway over. The horse and I, at one point, both landed in the water. It was cold enough to discourage the water. Ice began to form on both of us by the time we reached the other side. Sympathy, I quickly recalled, was not indigenous to that wilderness. I was willing to laugh at myself, but my teeth were chattering so hard I was afraid I'd bite off my tongue. We're 12 miles from the river now, having reached the blue ridge of the high mesa. Wolf Voice says we're near the Sioux main camp. Casey and Thompson are conferring. If we're stalled long enough, I plan to catch some of the landscape which is strewn with frozen cattle and horses, evidently abandoned by the Sioux. We're going to make our way up this trail. What, that trail, Lieutenant, is too steep. We'll never make it. Some of us will. It'll save a day's marching. All right, move out. <laughs> Lieutenant, this isn't the first perilous trail I've ever encountered, but this... You're free to head back, Remington. You mean cross that river again? Thanks. Besides, if... Think of the view once you get to the top. We dismount and start up. It tells on your wind and tries the leg muscles. Up a steep incline, a horse wants to go fast, and you have to keep him from running over you. A bend in the trail where water is frozen seems impassable. But I jump across it, and then I pull the bridle, urging the horse on. If I were the horse, I'd balk. But the noble animal will try it. A leap, a plunging, and with a terrible scramble, we're all right. Now the incline is certainly 85 degrees. My horse trips, but a pull at the bridle steadies him, and he plunges past me to be caught by Wolf Voice at the top of the trail. Miraculously, we've all made it. Well, Rington, what do you think? It's all black. The whole plane is blackened. Fire. They burned everything and left their stronghold. Lieutenant? <clears throat> the north, there's some grass still burning. I smashed my field glasses getting up here. Let me have yours. Yes, sir. Here. I think I can make out some figures just beyond the flame. You're right. Sue, maybe? Maybe. I'm going to ride ahead a piece to make sure. Sergeant. What if they are, Sue? And then Lieutenant Casey's going to have his hands full. Orders or no orders, our men ain't going to keep their guns posted in the face of them engines. And you? Stick to your painting, Remington. Wolf, boys. Come here. By the flame. And men on horseback. Sue. You sure? Sue. Around us. Everywhere. Looks like you'll get your chance to paint a Sue, Remington. If you live long enough. There's two, all right. I found three of our scouts massacred just up ahead. Now, you listen to me, all of you. We're going to ride ahead and have a parley. The first man who falls out of ranks, I'll shoot right between the eyes. Move out. We 
rode at an easy gait. The Sioux knew we were coming and stopped to wait for us. Several of them stopped on a hill, and I'm watching them now through Thompson's field glasses. Lieutenant Casey's riding through them unarmed. Somehow, I have to get closer to a Sioux. Their costumes, their war paint have all been described to me, but I must see them firsthand if I'm going to portray them. Glad to see you back, Lieutenant. Private, take my horse. What happened? Well, they're not planning an attack. At least they don't seem to be, and they claim they aren't. They uh, borrowed my tobacco. They said I could send a wagon to Pine Ridge for provisions. Well, we don't need nothing yet. We've got food and ammunition left the last few more days. I didn't tell them that. I want to get somebody through to Pine Ridge in case there are any messages from General Miles. I'd like to be on that wagon. A lot of my things got ruined in the river. All right. Thompson, you can take Remington, Wolf, Boyce, and Swenson for a team, sir. I want all guns kept inside the wagon. Yes, yes sir. I'm going to send Wells ahead while you're hitching up the wagon. Well, if we're going, I don't understand why, sir. Now, they're not expecting a lone courier and... Just because they said they'd let a wagon through doesn't mean they'll keep their word. Well, Lieutenant Casey, I can never figure out whether you're trying to do me a favor or get rid of me. Frankly, Remington, I'd like to do both. Mm. Uh, no offense, friend, but the West is no place for an artist. Maybe someday. Someday, Casey, all this will be gone. Your job is to protect people out here. I guess I'm just trying to preserve an image of all you're protecting. <laughs> About 20 minutes have passed since we left Lieutenant Casey's camp. I've been alternating between riding inside the wagon and alongside it. While mounted, I get the perspective I want, and then inside the wagon, I rough it in on what's left of my sketch pad. Sergeant! Man in road! Let me dead! Wolf Voice has seen something, and Swenson, our Swedish teamster, is racing toward it. Is he dead, Sergeant? Uh, good as. Bullet right through him. Where are they? They're too close. Wolf boys? There. Sue on hill. More there. Look. Six of them riding this way. You religious man, Remington? They're riding slow. They just want to talk. How's your Sue? My French is better. Wolf boys? Ride out and meet them. See what they want. No gun? Would it help any? No. I give tobacco. Take mine. I just quit smoking. Is this obedience to orders, Sergeant, or uh, discretion? Mr. Remington, this is a bad hole. And I reckon our cake is just dough right about now. Well, why would they tell Casey we could go through and then stop us? Well, they broke up their stronghold. Probably bands of two wandering all around these hills. Let's just say they got their smoke signals crossed. Uh. And now you have to do what you think the lieutenant would want you to do, huh? That's about the size of it. You know, Sergeant, I've got a lot of respect for you, Lieutenant. Sometimes it's a lot easier to shoot than it is to keep your gun holstered. You're sure doing a lot of parrying out there. And I'm still not close enough to get a good look at one of those Sioux. Say, Sergeant, what do you think Lieutenant Casey would do now if I asked him to let me ride out there to Wolf Voice and those Sioux? You're staying right here. I'm inclined to think he'd shrug and say it was my neck and let me go, huh? Forget it. Sergeant, those Sioux are in war dress, war paint. They're the reason I came out here. And the longer I just sit here, the more frustrated I get. You're not going nowhere. Now, look... There are 240 pounds of me that say you're not going to stop me. And by the time you get a gun out of the wagon, I'd be too far away to hit. That is, if you'd be fool enough to fire, considering all the circumstances. Peter, I'll split you down the middle with an axe if I have to. Run me. Get back here. Run me. Right slow, you hear me? Right slow, they'll figure it's a trick of some kind. Remington! Right! Oh! 
Ride slow. He's right. The Sioux are watching, and so are the others. But they're not making a move. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I can see him now, the one wolf voice is talking to. I can really see him. A perfect animal like no other on Earth. Cold, brutal, yet magnificently beautiful. A face replete with human depravity. Stolid, ferocious, arrogant. Yet a passionate, and I'm sure at times a compassionate human being. And all the rest, war paint, feathers, armed to the teeth. As a picture, perfect. As a reality, terrifying, fascinating, unforgettable. And that's good. When I get to a canvas, I won't forget. That is, if I live that long. They say, we go back. Not let us pass. Must hurry. Remington, you could have gotten us all killed. Now, I don't think we should take the time to speculate on what might have happened, Sergeant. All right, Swenson, turn the wagon around. We're going back. Wolf Voice, you take Remington's horse. You get up here with me, Painter. Now, I'll get back. My pad's there. Swenson, go slow now. Don't run. Or they'll sure shoot. Forget that last order. Run for it, Swenson. Sergeant, look. It's not the Sioux. It's some cowboys attacking them. Faster, Swenson. Faster! Yeah, yeah. Where'd they come from? Who knows? Probably thinking those Sioux were going to attack us. That poor rescue party's going to get itself back. And the Sioux probably figure we tricked them. That's why we got to get back to camp. Who boys, Swenson? If anyone is hit, get off in the grass and lie down. We're almost out of range. Swenson! Work those horses! Faster! We deployed on the flanks of the wagon so that the team horses might not be shot, which would have stopped all of us. We did ten miles at a record-breaking gallop and struck the scout camp in a blaze of excitement. Lieutenant Casey simply watched our arrival and never asked a single question. Thompson swore that the next time he went to war in a wagon, the drinks would be on him. It's dark now, and there's a blizzard blowing. Sleet is freezing in our faces. Somehow, we're expected to sleep in this. If the man who designed my saddle knew that I'd be using it for a pillow, I'm sure he'd have made some considerable revisions. But I shouldn't complain. I've taken the blanket from my horse. He'll survive the night without it. But I'm not sure I will. With it. Wake up. There's a Captain Baldwin here from General Miles' staff. He's ordered you to ride back with him to Pine Ridge tonight. Well, I... I've seen my Sue. I can paint him now. But you, Casey, what'll you do? What I have to do. You ever get to New York? I hope to. We'll have a drink together. This was the end of my experience with Lieutenant Casey and his gallant men. We shook hands in the dim candlelight of the campfire. And I mounted and rode away. Three days have passed since I left Pine Ridge. I'm in the dining car of a train taking me back to New York. Yesterday's papers observed that with the death of Sitting Bull and the subsequent minor battles, such as those I witnessed, the end to all military conflicts between the Indians and whites should be at hand. I hope so. I'm anxious now to get Well, back if to... you're not painting, you're writing. Rupp! Well, I thought they had you chained to that desk in New York. When did you board? Chicago, which is as far west as my wife will allow me, 
and my courage will take me. <laughs> sit down, sit down. I'll pour you some coffee. Say, uh, weren't you just in the middle of that mess out in the Dakotas? Yeah, I spent Christmas and New Year's there. I was just reading about it in the morning paper. Oh, I haven't seen today's paper yet. Don't suppose you knew this Casey fellow? Casey? Lieutenant Casey? Yep, yeah, that's the one. Let me see that. Yeah, shot and killed by a Sioux called Plenty Horses. These names, <laughs> they really think them up, don't they? Casey dead. You did know him, Remington? Yes. He was quite a soldier. Yes, yes, I knew him. I never could figure you, Remington. Chasing about in that savage wilderness just so you can paint cowboys and Indians. What for? Because I love that country. And I love the people. The West has a story, Rupp. And more than anything else in this world, I want to tell it. I want to tell it in a way that it'll never be forgotten. For all his exposure to danger, Frederick Remington died a natural death shortly after his 48th birthday. In 1907, President Theodore Roosevelt made a prophetic tribute to Frederick Remington when he said, Remington is, of course, one of the most typical artists we have ever had, and he has portrayed a most characteristic and yet vanishing type of American life. The soldier, the cowboy, the rancher, the Indian, the horses and the cattle of the plains will live in his pictures and bronzes, I verily believe, for all time. This has been another portrait in an American gallery. Today, Westward the Painter, starring Richard Widmark as Frederick Remington. Featured in the cast were Carl Swenson, Dick Nelson, Shepard Mencken, Sam Edwards, and Paul Wexler. Sound by Gene Twombly. The story was written by Robert M. Young, produced and directed by William Lally. Art Ballinger speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.